and welcome once again to another inspirational talk for the day. Could you help me by telling me what you think about the EU Green Deal or something? Okay, so up now is Thomas Waits. He's a passionate organic farmer. He's a co-chair of the European Green Party and a member of the European Parliament. What a plethora of speakers we have in this year's session of GLF Digital Conference. Thomas's work is focused on sustainable agriculture, regional production, and healthy food. Can we welcome Thomas? Okay, uh, thank you, Daniel. And uh, thank you for that invitation uh, to that Global Landscape Conference. Um, as you already mentioned, uh, I'm a farmer myself and uh, dealing with all these issues a lot in the European Parliament. And what I experience in the moment is that the crisis that we're in in the moment around this COVID uh, virus actually brings a lot of um, attention uh, and consciousness within society to some certain issues. First of all, it's a, it's a global um, uh, crisis experience that we find ourselves in. So every single person feels how a crisis actually looks like. And this, to my opinion, raises the awareness on how a climate and biodiversity uh, crisis would actually look uh, and affect our society. So that's, for me, um, um, I would say a positive point um, of, of this uh, real downside of this COVID crisis. But also, like, in a very concrete um, uh, manner, um, it raises attention on the interlinkage of, our, of the way how we live our lives, the way we use landscapes uh, or we claim landscapes for human use and we push back uh, the areas that stay for nature uh, and natural habitats. And this leads to an increase of zoonotic diseases. And uh, it's quite interesting that this link, I mean, we knew it before, but now it even finds it way, its way into the headlines of media. So people start to realize, okay, our way of living has a direct impact uh, on our health uh, in that case. But also um, the, the link to, to, to the question that uh, food supply is not given uh, under any circumstances. So uh, suddenly you find yourself standing in front of empty supermarket shelves. And suddenly the question starts to appear, well, what has food supply to do with uh, global markets? What has a food chain to do uh, with whether it's produced in the region or whether it depends on global supply. And how risky is it actually to depend on global supply in terms of food? And then it raises the question, well, shouldn't we maybe not invest more into a regional food production, into short chains, value chains uh, from the producers, the farmers, to the citizens. And more and more citizens start to realize, well, it's the farmers out there that produce my food. And they start to think about how is it actually produced? How does it come to the supermarket? Uh, and what effects does this have on my health? But also on the landscape I witness and I would like to spend my weekend in. Uh, but further, further down uh, that road, it also raises some questions about globalization. Not the general question whether global trade is a useful thing or not. I'm sure it is a useful thing but about the dogma that any good shall be kind of ruled under WTO treaty ruling, um, whether food is maybe not uh, a good that needs some exemptions. And I'm referring there to the term of food sovereignty, uh, about uh, also allowing countries to regulate the importation of food. And again, this uh, has a direct impact on the landscapes because many countries face problematic issues with uh, being spilled with very cheap industrial, uh, industrial produced food and uh, can't maintain their own farmers on the land, which very often practice traditional ways of agriculture that respect the interaction with nature, that respect the inter interaction with landscapes uh, and, uh, uh, and allow more and more industrial agriculture to take over. And also the key role of workers, in our case of agricultural workers, but also Medicare workers and so on. Uh, and people start to realize what crucial role these people have in supplying our societies in terms of agricultural workers with food. 
And so the value of the, of the work these people give to our societies is raising. Here in the European Parliament, we had just a week ago the presentation of two new strategies, which is the biodiversity strategy and the so-called farm to fork strategy. And I must say, um, in the context of European policies, both proposals uh, are welcomed by us in the Green Group here, but also the Green Party. And they are also welcomed, at least partly welcomed, by civil society dealing with these issues because it's asking the right questions and proposing a good strategy on how to cope and how to actually change our land use and our agricultural model uh, to a more sustainable way and sustainable, not in, in, way, in the way of sustaining profits, but in the way of sustaining the ability of our soils and uh, of our landscapes to provide living areas and at the same time food production for us in the European Union and abroad. And the question is that what we are actually having the biggest battles about is how do we implement this farm to fork strategy and this biodiversity strategy into CAP? CAP will still uh, um, spend around 35% of the overall EU budget uh, to, to the farming sector. And indeed, the farming sector in Europe today is more part of the problem than part of the solution. And part of the problem if you look at climate change, but especially also if you look at the land use and the effects of land use that we have. Uh, the questions are, are the subsidies going to the right people? Are the subsidies honoring the right strategies that farmers take? Or are they actually supporting an increased disaster? And yes, it's a double fold answer because CAP is a very big um, um, portfolio of different measurements and different states also use it in a different way. But there is an overall um, assumption that in the sum, most of the money goes into the wrong direction. And so what we're trying in the moment is to ask for coherence in the European uh, um, policy. And this is, uh, this is an obligatory measurement. So European policies have to be coherent, which makes sense because you can't uh, have a, a law, one law going into one direction and next day another law going into another direction. And so that's why we're heavily demanding to renegotiate the next cap uh, proposal in terms of implementing and applying these new strategies, biodiversity strategy and farm to fork strategy, which is quite a tough battle uh, where we see uh, ourselves faced with very strong lobbyism, uh, uh, especially from the, from the uh, agro supply sector. So from the fertilizer producers, the pesticide producers, uh, the GMO seed producers, they are heavily, heavily um, countering um, our efforts. They are heavily lobbying. I've just seen a paper from um, um, Business Europe, which is the, the um, uh, some of all the business representation bodies in the European Union who try to uh, heavily argue that we have to skip all these green measures, all these biodiversity measures, because uh, economical recovery now is more important than anything else. And this should be the only leading guiding principle that we have. And there you see already how how short term viewed their perspective is. They are ready to actually uh, endanger the, the future of our next generations for short term profits. And this is quite rude. So we, we see ourselves actually standing, or I find myself standing next to the commission president who comes from the conservatives, uh, who tries to defend at least partly the green policies that they produce proposed earlier. And it may, it's, it's a, an interesting experience because especially the conservatives in the European Parliament, especially in the agri uh, committee, are the ones that try to water down all biodiversity, landscape and uh, uh, greening measures for the agricultural sector. But overall, um, I see a very positive signal in that too, that the commission has understood that on the long term, there's only one way, which is cooperating with nature and finding ways to sustain uh, our living um, conditions to the next generations. And this is a quite responsible way uh, um, uh, they take. 
Um, I, and I want to end with, with actually with a quote of a, of a leading civil servant of the commission. And this, this happened in a, uh, it was an event about uh, um, uh, forests, uh, old grown forests and ancient forests getting chopped down in Romania. And it's a big corruption case and everything else. But no matter, uh, the, the person from, it was a, a, a man called De La Rosa for all the ones of you who are interested. Um, so he said a very crucial sentence. And the sentence is, look, uh, there is, a bio, that there is a biosphere without economy, but there's no economy without biosphere. And, you know, well, you can think, well, good morning, friends. Yeah, uh, it's so timely that you suddenly realize, I say, this is a very positive signal that leading parts or leading bodies of the European Union have finally understood that economy and ecology landscapes, flowering landscapes, and the flourishing economy are not contradicting each other, but are depending on each other. And we need to solve both in one. And this is what we're fighting for. Thank you for this invitation and for this great Congress you're holding. Thank you very much, Tom. That was amazing. Wow. It's, 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 it's kind of very wonderful to have all these perspectives coming together at GLF Bonn. Let's take another one. We'll also hear from Canile Martine, who is an anchor, deep demonstration of resilient food systems from the European Institute of Technology's Climate Branch, also known as EIT Climate Tech, which is working to accelerate the transition to a zero carbon economy. I think that Penila, you'd have to give GLF some credit here for, for actually organizing this massive conference at this large scale with actually virtually zero carbon. Wow. We are, that, we, we've done well. Over 5,000 people in attendance on, on, on the Hoover app. And we have a social media reach of over 43 million Zero carbon. You should give us an applause. I will. Wow. Thank you very much to GLF and the whole entire team. I hand over the microphone to you, Penile. Thank you. Take us away. Uh, yeah, and I'm really happy to see that, that COVID has taught us this as well, how to do large meetings and conferences without flying in and out of all kinds of countries. So that's really lovely. So as Daniel said, I'm Pernille martini Modi, and I come from uh, EIT Climate Kick, which is the, um, the climate branch of the uh, European Institute of Technology, EIT. And I have some slides here to share with you. So let me try to share my screen and let me know if it works. So I hope you can see it now. If not, let me know somehow. Okay, so I'm here to talk about how we, our take on how we operationalize some of this, uh, some of the changes that uh, that Tom, Tom advised, advised, uh, advised just uh, pointed out, and I couldn't agree more with him. I, I, we're so much on the same line, so that's lovely. So I see it as my duty to, to take part in realizing the farming farm to fork strategy and the biodiversity strategy. Um, climate kick. Oops, let me change slide. Climate Kick is a, a partner community of more than uh, 300 partners, and uh, we're dedicated to tackling climate change through innovation and to respond to the climate emergency. And we are in a state of emergency now. Um, last November, in November last year, the European Parliament declared a climate emergency, and the EU Green Deal was presented by EU Commission President van der Leyen, uh, and it cr clearly cl calls for systemic responses. Um, and since then, COVID has showed us, shown us a bit uh, in practice of, of how to apply crisis management in a systemic level. And it turns out that we can, in fact, manage it. Um, and this practice in, in, in climate, uh, in crisis management will come in handy quite soon, I think, uh, if we fail to be at the forefront of uh, an emerging food crisis due to climate change and biodiversity loss. And the climate kick and, uh, and the EU in general, have put in a lot of money in, into climate innovations over the past years. Um, but we've just seen that the speed and scale of, of the impact is just not enough. 
In fact, we need to work six times faster to reach a zero emissions in time. And with this, uh, Climate Kick has come to the realization that the old model of, of applying innovation is just not enough. Um, so we've changed the way how we invest in projects and ideas and new technologies. So we no longer treat funding applications we receive one by one, uh, but we look at them as a portfolio of connected uh, activities. And here you can see uh, the portfolio in our food and agriculture uh, uh, sort of theme, um, uh, where you can see the system of interconnected projects. Um, and this portfolio works across education, technology and citizen engagement and a lot of other levers of change. Um, the portfolios are led by demand uh, from entire uh, countries and regions and cities and industries. At EIT Climate Kick, I lead um, a large uh, systems innovation project on, on sust sust food systems and healthy diets. And um, we are working to begin with in the Nordic countries. So that is Denmark, Sweden, Norway, um, Iceland and Finland. And um, we have joining, we are joining forces with a lot of cool actors there and also the, the Nordic innovation agencies uh, in these countries to, to work on a joint mission uh, for, uh, for change in our agri-food sector. Um, these are the organizations that we are currently either working directly with or in dialogue with in terms of, of uh, implementing this deep demonstration. Um, and food systems are super complex, uh, probably more complex than any other systems we have uh, on, on this earth. And um, so it doesn't really help to, to adjust bits and pieces along the value chain. Um, and therefore, oh, sorry. <laughs> and therefore we, we are looking, we've, we're sort of, to simplify it a little bit for ourselves, we're looking at challenge ownership. So working with challenge owners in representing primary, primary production. So that is uh, both food and feed and at land and sea. And then we're looking at retail and we're looking at consumer behavior and governance and everything that intersect between those areas. Um, we work with a methodology where we go through four phases together with our challenge owners and, and design partners. Um, and we work to uh, sort of figure out what is the intent, what, where, where do we wanna go? And then we map the system and look at where could possible interventions be. And then we decide a portfolio of, of interventions which we hope to start implementing next year. And throughout the whole process, we want to learn uh, to gather intelligence so that we can replicate in other regions. Um, so starting with the Nordics is, is not just enough. Um, yeah, and um, at this point, we're sort of entering the last decade where we can actually do something about this this uh, situation that we've brought ourselves in as a human species. Um, so this is the time to sh turn the ship around. And agri agriculture and forestry and other land use uh, uh, activities represent a fifth of global greenhouse gas, greenhouse gas emissions. So we think that this, this is the absolute most important place to start. Um, um, so the world's climate and ecological emergency cannot be addressed without significant transformation in, in this area. And this is what we've set out to do or take our part in doing now. And we invite partners and, and uh, interested funders to join us in, in this work. Um, and uh, so if you're interested, please get in contact. You can see my uh, details here on the screen or find me in the program, I think, or look me up on the big internet. Thank you very much.